And I also would like to, would like to give an introduction of uh, the work that we've done across the city, not only in the Bronx, but all over the city. Uh, we're starting our Six to Celebrate program, and this is the, um, our, the 13th version of the Six to Celebrate program. And uh, we're encouraging community-based groups to participate this year. This is a, a very useful program for groups that are interested in, in preserving the um, historic treasures of their neighborhoods. We provide uh, technical assistance, our knowledge, our strategies, and our point of view for them to advance their historic preservation objectives. And we do walking guides, walking tour guides like these ones. These ones are all in Spanish. So we, we have some of those in Spanish. If you want to check them out, please visit our website, hdc.org. And we've also done, we've also highlighted other community members that have represented a very important uh, role in their communities, in the development, in the social development of their communities. This is an example of uh, one of those community leaders, Mike Amadeo. He's the owner of Casa Amadeo. And he, he's, he's done wonderful contributions to the culture, to the Latin culture of the Bronx. If you wanna know more about those interviews and those uh, programs that we've done in the past, you can also visit our U YouTube channel where he, we have those interviews and those videos. Um, these are two other examples of that. And with that, so today we're gonna be talking about the Manaida, Manaida Street Historic District. This is the newest historic district in New York City. It was designated in May of 2020. All the houses that are, that, that are on that block were built between 1908 and 1909. And they all, they all have a um, Renaissance revival style and Flemish revival style. And the development of this street was a response of the uh, improvements in transportation that were taking place at the turn of the century in the Bronx. So developers wanted to take advantage of that and you know, provide housing for, for the middle class. And um, it's located right here in the middle of this uh, red circle in south, south of the Bronx. And as you can see, there are just a few landmarks around it, only two landmarks. One of those is the, um, the, the house, the whole house, which was designated in 1981. And the other one is the American Bank Note Company, which was designated in 2008. So not too many landmarks in that area. That's why it was very important and relevant that the LPC designated this street last year. And more to the, to the west, we also have a New York Public Library uh, in, in Hans Point as a, as a landmark. And, uh, and so the designation of this historic district is something that started, as I mentioned, very, very early on in 2008 with a, a very strong community support. And the, the Historic Districts Council has been very fortunate to um, connect with those community members who were involved in the designation process. As I said, one of those community members who was involved in the process is gonna be talking with us later today and she's gonna be telling us more about that process. And these pictures were taken at the end of uh, 20, at the beginning of 2020. We did a wonderful walking tour in, uh, in Manaida Street. And what's, what's so interesting about this uh, walking tour is that we only wanted to invite community members because something that we realized when we did a uh, walking tours in the Bronx is that we never had community members. We never, never had uh, community members all the people who attended those tours were, were coming from Manhattan or from outside the city or from Brooklyn, but uh, we never had people from the Bronx. So for this walking tour, we wanted to just invite community members to invite them to, uh, you know, 
really invite the people who, who live there. And Maria Torres was very helpful in, in, in inviting those community members. And uh, this was a very unique walking tour. And as I said, Maria Torres, she's the head of the, the point. The point is uh, this is located in this building and it's right next to, to Manaida Street. So with that introduction, I would like to welcome Angel to give us a, a better overview of the Manaida Street Historic District. Thank you, Diego. Let me just uh, share my screen real quick. So uh, Diego, everyone, thank you for having me. Uh, as some of you know me, my name is Angel Hernandez. I, uh, I'm also president of a landmark uh, at Westchester Square. It's called the Huntington Free Library and Reading Room. Uh, we have information here on Bronx uh, history. So if uh, you wanted to know more about that, just feel free to drop me a note. Uh, thank you, Diego, for your great introduction to uh, explaining the, the Manita Street uh, designation. Uh, I remember that walking tour. It was pretty chilly that day, but um, Hunts Point happens to be one of my, my favorite areas because there's just so much history there, and there are just so many buildings that deserve landmark status. You know, you mentioned it. There's, there's not many there. So there's a lot more historic structures that, that should get that equal treatment. So you're looking at uh, Manita Street, and this is uh, looking from Garrison Avenue uh, towards Lafayette Avenue. And uh, it's a collection of 42 homes. Uh, the primary designers and developers was the Manita Company, uh, James F. Meehan, uh, Dalb and Kremberg. And uh, James F. Meehan was in charge of the west side of, of this street, whereas the two other companies, Manita Company and, and Dalb and Kremberg, they were in charge of the east side. And it, it's just a collection. It's a uniform collection of Flemish revival architectural style. Uh, and you can see the, the staple protruding bays uh, with, with the rounded windows. But the west side happens to be a little more ornamental. So the name that really jumps out in Bronx history uh, uh, amongst the others that I just mentioned is James Meehan because uh, he's had some... Uh, uh, other uh, projects throughout the Bronx. And Diego, if you mentioned uh, a person that's connected to one of those projects, uh, Mike Amadeo. Uh, Casa Amadeo is located in the Manhattan building, which is another of a James uh, Meehan building. It's our own flat iron uh, building in the South Bronx that separates Prospect and Longwood Avenue off of Westchester Avenue. So that's another Meehan project. Uh, James Meehan was, uh, was an associate of William Morgenthau and company. Uh, William Morgenthau designed, uh, well, developed, and was behind the, the erection of the Hunts Point Palace and all the other buildings uh, that's facing the storefronts, the, the block fronts rather, on East 163rd Street and Hunts Point Avenue in that intersection. Uh, another big player in the development uh, uh, at the time when, when these buildings were constructed on Manita was the American Real Estate Company, which is ARICO, That's, that was their acronym. And uh, they were basically in charge of the buildings along Westchester Avenue, where West Farms and Southern Boulevard meets. So here are the big developers. William Johnson was also a developer. And these big development companies started off as smaller speculators building taxpayer buildings and, and, and you know smaller dwellings attached to, to train lines or proposed train lines just to make some money and, and already anticipating the, 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 the building boom that was gonna happen at that time. And we're talking about the turn of the century. Uh, most of, well, all of the structures of Manita Avenue was constructed between 1908 and 1909. And this is basically uh, coinciding with some of the earlier train stations that were being built. One of them was Simpson Street on the two line and Intervale. Those go back to 1904, 1905. So that pretty much was the impetus of seeing the development boom that brought us Manita Street and these beautiful structures. But as you know, as a historian, you know, I like to play around and talk a little bit about history. 
you know, development boom intensified at the turn of the century, but it pretty much started, you know, it, it had a slow start dating back to the mid 19th century all the way on. And this was with the introduction of the locomotive in the area. You had the New York, Westchester and Boston uh, uh, running through this area. This was the only commuter line that was laid out in the 1870s and it took on uh, some other entities, but it was still a commuter line up until the 1930s when it finally bankrupt. Uh, and when it bankrupt, that, it, I mean, it, it just faced a stiff competition with uh, the subway lines that came in the 1920s. So you saw that impetus though. You saw that start of a, of, of a development boom, but not as much as you saw in the turn of the 20th century. So when I talk about development boom, it's not building, it's not tenements, it's not townhouses, it's mansions. <laughs> you know, Hunts Point had a collection of beautiful mansions. You know, in fact, the South Bronx, you know, it was the backyard for the rich. You know, you had the Tiffany's, you had uh, the Fail family, uh, you had the Coster family. Uh, these were families, affluent uh, millionaires at the time. Uh, they had their, their city houses, you know, in Manhattan, but their summer homes were here in the Bronx, what they would call Westchester County or their private little estates and pretty much what you see here. But what I want to focus on is the one in the middle, Woodside, because that is where Manida is today. It's on the former estate of Edward G. Fail. Edward G. Fail was born in 1799. He, uh, he was born in Scotland. Uh, he immigrated with his family when he was a, when he was an infant, and they moved to East Chester, which is now you know uh, the Pelham section of the Bronx, just right outside of Pelham Bay Park. Uh, but later on, they moved to Westchester County, and uh, he was a he was a prosperous merchant. He was in the textile business. He was a president of the, the New York Agricultural uh, Society. And uh, this was his estate, Woodside. Uh, this is now roughly off of Lafayette Avenue. And uh, uh, this was pretty much uh, his country seat. He was a good friend of the whole family, good friends with the whole family, uh, Richard March Ho. We have Ho Avenue in the area. Uh, people are like, where does Ho come from, right? Well, the word Ho is Old English for hill. Uh, it comes from the Ho family, Richard March Ho and his brother Peter Ho. Uh, Diego, you just showed his house a little while ago, Sunny Slope, which is now the African Methodist Church on uh, uh, Fell Street. Well, these guys were in the printing business. Richard March Hole was the inventor of the rotary press. And he also invented the machine that, that was able to stamp tickets. And it, legend has it that it was Edward Fail that gave him the idea, that inspired him uh, for such an invention. So uh, it so happens, and it's just a coincidence is that uh, you know you have uh, uh, you have your I, I would say your heritage of writers. You know you have Longfellow, Whittier. You have all these streets named after writers. Printers Park, right? Drake Park. But you also have the the printers themselves, Whole Avenue, uh, and then later on on this same land. You know, by the way, this is when this was all being cleared out on, on the failed estate to, you know, for land speculators and, and, and to open up the land for other development. Uh, by the way, this is Soundview Park in the back. Well, they kept the tradition of the plant, the printing, the writing tradition, and uh, they came up with the American Banknote Company, which I'm going to bring up in a little while. But when they finally cleared the, the land on the fail estate, uh, it, it, you didn't see development happening of these residents uh, real quickly. You saw institutions being erected. And one of them was the monastery, the Corpus Christi Monastery on Lafayette Avenue. Uh, this was founded in the 1880s. It was completed in 1890. It was founded by Dominican uh, sisters. Uh, uh, first, they were situated in St. Louis. Uh, later on in Detroit, and finally in the Bronx. Uh, this is just a rare image of the interior of the, the monastery. Uh, you're not allowed to walk in there unless it's like a jubilee, uh, especially if you're a man. <laughs> they're not, you know, allowed, uh, they're just not letting you in. But these are just great images that I like to share. Um, and then there's the Bank Note building. I actually thought that was the next slide, so... 
my bad. Uh, so the American banknote building was erected on the Fail estate, and it just so happens that the Fail family was just good friends with the whole family who were inventors of the rotary plant. So you have this, you know, this legacy happening in, in, in Hunts Point. Well, in 1908, uh, the Kirby Pettit and Green architect firm designed this, this behemoth of, of an edifice, and it still stands today as the banknote building. Uh, the American Banknote Building was, was an expansion of, of the branch that was located downtown. Uh, this was the printing plant. Uh, the operation saw an expansion at the turn of the century. And when I mean expansion, it was a demand to print more bills. And that was a demand to print more bills for other countries. Uh, according to its, its, uh, its own histories, its own uh, accounts, they printed uh, currency for over 117 countries. So it's very interesting there. This was all part of the failed estate. By the way, the point is also located in one of its annex buildings uh, of the banknote building. This is where uh, Maria uh, Torres is, uh, hails from, and we'll hear from her later on. Quick story, one of my favorite stories. This is the tower of the banknote building. Uh, there was a person named J uh, uh, Joseph Ford. He was nicknamed the honest counterfeiter because his job was to counterfeit different plates uh, that, were, that were forged that day. And if he was able to succeed, they had to stop all production of those plates. So that was his sole uh, responsibility of the job. And his office was right here in the tower. Uh, you have numerous organizations uh, headquartered here. And I believe Congressman Richie Torres is headquartered here as well. But it's still a beautiful building, beautiful complex, and it's maintained very well. Another institution that was founded at the turn of the century, you're looking at the Sevilla Home for Children. Uh, this was another huge behemoth complex that sat just right next to the, the, the Corpus Christi Monastery, which is now the, the, the Jose Caraballo uh, ball fields. Uh, where the Hunts Point Recreation Center sits today. Uh, this was completed in 1909. In 1908 and 1909, at the same time, the Menida uh, uh, structures were completed. And uh, it was an orphanage. And it, it first started off as a girls, a young girls orphanage. And it was founded by this person here. His name was Jose Maria Sevilla. He was a Peruvian millionaire. And in his will, he set aside half a million dollars uh, to build uh, this, this behemoth of a complex. I, I believe this is a Spanish colonial style. Um, a lot of people uh, confused it for a, a monastery itself. It looks sort of religious, but no, this was, a, uh, this was an orphanage. Unfortunately, it took on some more nefarious uh, uh, functions. It became a uh, detention for, for girls. Later on, it became a detention for all kids. And it became a precursor for Spotford uh, 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 Correctional Facility, which was uh, erected in the 1950s. So uh, this complex was finally closed in the mid 1970s because of what was, you know, what was the city, what was going on at the time, and and the practices that were happening in these institutions, and also the treatment, you know, of, of the young girls when it was a detention uh, center. But it gives a, a little history to the word Manida. So if you look at uh, John McNamara's History in Asphalt, you know, the Encyclopedia of Street Names and Places, you know, it lists Manida Street as named after, uh, I believe, a some maid, a Lady Ida, or something like that. But th here's the, the more the story that gives a little more credence to that. Manida in Spanish. Manida means either something that's worn, something that's been stretched or, you know, just been worn out or just been used over, over and over again, something to hang, you hang on, or it means a place of refuge, a place where, where you can just, just be for a time being. So that's where the word comes from. It's, it's not used very much in, in a contemporary Spanish language, but that's where the word comes from, manida. It means a, a place of refuge. And, and, and this all goes back to uh, the Sevilla home for children. This is how it looks today. I like how everything comes full circle. 
Um, it started off as a, a, an orphanage for children. It had a great cause. And we were just uh, very happy that we have this facility that once again was, was built for, for a similar purpose to serve children of today. But what was going on, you know, when these institutions, when we were being erected? Well, now you have your residences. Now you have the subway lines being laid out. You know, uh, as I mentioned before, the Simpson uh, Street Station uh, was, was erected in 05. Uh, Intervale as well, you had the number two train. The subway line was being extended, you know, on 149th Street. So this was sparking more of a development boom because it was offering an option for people and an affordable option as well. So you saw these subway lines being dug out underground and these entrances, you know, just coming out of nowhere. What you're looking at here on your left uh, are these billboards, these, these real estate ads that were just placed all over. Uh, remember I mentioned uh, people like James Meehan and, and, and William Johnson, these guys, they were just building these small little buildings, taxpayer structures along the train routes or, or proposed train routes. Well, they would post this all over and they knew what was gonna happen. They knew the plans, they knew uh, what type of uh, edifices that, that were gonna be erected. And later on, when they got into the business and expanded into their own huge development firms, uh, they became in charge of the buildings that you see here. They were the creators of it. So just take a look at this ad here. Ever think of living in the Bronx? And they think about spacious living rooms, you know, and they think about proximity to city hall and, you know, elevators, you know, and all these sweet view, you know, the, all the benefits that you have just, just me, just by moving out into the annex district, which is, you know, what we call the Bronx today. You know, this is the American real estate company. On your right, on the top right is a, a Morgenthau um, a creation. That is the Hunts Point Palace on your right. Uh, that was completed in 1913. Now it's a special building because it's, it's, it's the first structure in the Bronx that actually shows the seal, the, the Bronx, uh, the coat of arms on it. If you look just closely on the top of the, the Hunts Point Palace, you see that round item there. That is the seal of, of the Bronx flag. And, and, and it's the coat of arms of Jonas Bronx that says, Nessa de Malice, uh, yield not to evil. This was the first building. And in fact, it, it, it was there before the actual Bronx flag was instituted which was in 1914. So the Hunts Point Palace holds much history, not in, in, in Hunts Point, but in the Bronx as well. And across the street, you have some of the other uh, James Meehan uh, creations when, when he was with the Morgenthau firm and when he went in business on his own. And finally, on the bottom, you have a a Rico Park. A Rico is the acronym for American Real Estate Company. A, Re a Rico Park was the central park of the American Real Estate Company's, you know, project, uh, which was at the time the Simpson Avenue, uh, Southern Boulevard, uh, uh, West Farms. You know that area there. Those, which by the way, those structures are still standing. If anyone's familiar with Checkers, that's located right on the corner of Southern Boulevard and, and, and West Farms, that's, a, that's American real estate company. Anyway, what you're looking at now, the top bottom, uh, I'm sorry, the bottom photo on your right, that's now the newer structures on Simpson Avenue, uh, the housing developments that were completed in 1982. So the buildings you see here no longer exist, but just gives you an idea of the abundance of tenement buildings. And, and by the way, when, when Monida, when those buildings were erected, yeah, they were Flemish style because you, had, you still had a German, a German population in the Bronx, but you also had a, a boom of Italian immigrants coming in and, 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 and other immigrants. And there were a lot of architectural styles inspired by these cultures. This is where you get Italian Renaissance, you know, and other these Baroque styles. So it was a, a golden age for architecture in the Bronx where you saw this Renaissance boom of all these architectural styles. And Monida Street, is, it just encapsulates that, that glory day of the Bronx. So 
that's my presentation. I can go on and on about this, but I am just so happy that Manita is finally being recognized as a person from the South Bronx and Soundview and doing tours there. It just brings me a delight. And I just hope it just inspired more uh, to be recognized in that area as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, Angel. Um, if, every, if anyone has any question, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, I do have one question for you, Angel. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. So I've been several times in, to Hans Point and I've seen the American banknote building and it's, it's beautiful. It's very, very gorgeous. And it was designated in 2008. And compared to the whole house, <laughs> was, which was designated in, in 1981. Why do you think uh, that disparity of, um, you know, how, why did it take so long to designate the American banknote company? So uh, I'll tell you what, um, I, I think there, it's, it's, there were several factors. One, I believe the American banknote building switched hands a couple of times since the 1970s when the banknote, build, the banknote company actually moved to New Jersey. So there were other development firms and uh, there were other entities located in that building that I, I believe it, it became sort of like a difficult situation for a landmarks designation to happen. Whether at, whereas the whole house, you know, it, it, it was always a place of, of worship. It was a synagogue years ago, right? Well, it was a residence, then it became a synagogue, then it became a church for a little while, and then it became uh, what it is today, which is another congregation. So I, I believe that was one reason. Uh, the second reason I, and I, I believe Maria could talk more about this, I believe the banknote building went through some issues structurally, you know, especially in the 70s and 80s. Um, there, there was some issues with that. Uh, but to tell you the truth, I really can't pinpoint it. Um, both buildings have historic significance. I mean, the banknote building, you know. Uh, but in my experience, you don't see a lot of factory buildings getting landmark status in the Bronx. I mean, heck, you got the Mott Haven Foundry building still standing, you know, in Mott Haven. And, and they're building right around it, right? So we don't know if they're going to tear that down. And, and that's perhaps one of the oldest factory buildings still standing in the South Bronx. So factory buildings don't get that status. It's, it's historic significance that bring it. So perhaps, you know, maybe the buildings along Mott Haven could get some historic status because of their, uh, because of piano legacy, right? But, you know, going back to the American banknote building, you know, there must have been some factors with it, but, you know, I just can't pinpoint it, but. Hopefully someone on this call can. Yeah, Maria, jump in. <laughs> well, I, I just want to jump in too, and in, in the same note, and I'm really also really surprised as well that the Corpus Christi Monastery isn't designated. I mean, yep. if we're going to go there, right? Yep. I mean, the whole mansion in, in the 80s, then you do the bank note in, 80, in uh, 2008, but the Corpus Christi Monastery has always been the same. I, I don't know if it's because so few people get to go in and actually see it or actually see the ground. But right. um, to me, that's also something that should be landmarked, you know, well, as well. Thank you, Maria, because, um, you know, when I mentioned earlier, you know, Hunts Point is one of my favorite tours because it allows me to shed history on buildings that are not landmarked, but they should be. And, and Corpus Christi is one of them. And on, on the day of Jubilee, I don't know when that's celebrated, but you can actually walk in and you have an unobstructed view of the Manhattan skyline. It's, it's a beautiful, you know, location in the cloisters there, but you're right. You know, it's, it's not landmark and, and it should be, it, it, it should be so. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, that building is, is very beautiful and there are many buildings in Hans Point that deserve to, to be landmark. Yeah. So in, in regard to that, how do you think the audience can help to bring attention to those uh, potential landmarks, to try to, you know, tell the LPC to pay attention to those 
beautiful historic buildings, how, how can the audience, how can the people who are attending this meeting help in any way? How well, it's all about, it's all about advocacy, right? It's all about, you know, get, getting everyone on board, you know, getting uh, Ralph Salamanca, especially, you know, Richie Torres. I mean, Richie Torres, he's a historian. He used to call me up all the time, you know, and I used to bore him. I, I never bored him. He loved listening to me. But it's all about advocacy. It's all about getting your letters of support together and, and, and sending it to Landmark's uh, preservation. It also takes involvement from the monastery as well. You know, uh, speak to your administrator there. See how they feel about be getting landmark status. You know, they, may, they might not have a, a full understanding of what it is. They might think landmark static. Oh, we're going to have, you know, tourists jumping out of tour buses, you know, taking photos. You know, probably there's a little education involved with that. But it's, it's all about advocacy, getting people together, getting your letters of support, and just hounding LPC. You know, hounding them and letting them know that. And I, the more and I think... Yeah, and, and I and I think exactly what you're saying, Angel and uh, and Maria. I mean, look at the work that Maria was doing over the years and the, the, the amount of time it took. But the fact that we do have this Brown Borough Landmarks Committee now, it's sort of kind of an entity, right? That we could walk into uh, Congressman Torres' office, we could walk into Salamanca's office and say, "Look, we've been doing this advocacy in our borough in partnership with the Historic District Council, and it is the first." Uh, borough committee that they partner with to do and where did they do it in the Bronx and I think that we do have a bit more leverage uh, and it shouldn't take as Diego was alluding it shouldn't take too long to get uh, to get something designated especially in our in our Bronx that we have so many treasures that like you're talking about it's just the craziest thing but I think with this committee we're we're beginning to get some traction yeah definitely Someone also asked on the chat if, if the Bronx Heart Museum is landmark. That that building is not landmark. It's uh, it's on on the um, Grand Concourse. It's very on beautiful, the Grand but it's Concourse. I don't think so. No, it's I not landmark. I, I think the the Andrew Friedman home across the street is. Yeah, um, but I no, don't. think... I just look it up, and it's not landmarked. Oh, Andrew Friedman? No, the Bronx. Art oh, oh the Bronx Museum of the Arts. No, I, I, I don't think so. It, I know they started in an old synagogue that was on that location. And then later on, you know, they, they rebuilt. Yeah. But it's, it's not landmark. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Andrew, for your wonderful presentation. And uh, I would like to welcome Maria Torres. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Maria. I know that you were involved in the process of landmarking Manaita Street from the beginning. And it was a very, very long process that started in 2008 and culminated last year. So tell us about that, uh, that process. How, how personally to you, what did that process mean and what motivated you to continue? Sure, and, but I wanna say, I mean, I have on my screen, I see everybody who's here and I do wanna say, so there, is, there is a very special person who could probably talk about it just as much as me on here. A gentleman, Daniel Carassus, was a resident, right, of Manita Street long before me. His family owned a home, I believe, 846 or so, um, 846 Manita Street. So he, he, his family has way deeper history than I do. But I, I thank you. He was uh, helpful when we were applying for the uh, for the um, landmarking and, and it's, it's nice to see him here tonight. And hopefully, you know, please, we'd love to hear from you as well at some point uh, this evening. Hopefully we'll have enough time. Um, for, for us, um, you know, for this block, uh, I, I started, I, I guess I, I moved here uh, probably in, in the 90s, 1995 or so. But I had seen, you know, I had worked in the community from before then. And Manita Street was always kind of like this anomaly of Hunts Point. You know, you had burnt out buildings, you had all sorts of things, uh, you know, devastations due to, you know, the fires and the crack and, you know, pandemics that happened and, and, and things like that. But this 800 block of Manita was always, always well-maintained, always like kind of withstood everything that happened around it. And so it was, it was always interesting. So even though I hadn't lived here 
working in the area, you, you saw that book, this block and you were always like, wow, that's so interesting that it was able to stay residential. It was able to be one of the few tree line blocks of, you know, both sides residential. Whereas everywhere else in, in, in Hunts Point was, had its issues. And so um, when I started working with the point in 1994, um, I moved to the block probably in 95. Um, people were always, you know, always proud of it and were always kind of trying to figure out how to crack that nut of, of, of making it historic because you had the, the Longwood section became historic um, probably, right, in, in the early 90s or so. I'm not sure when that became historic. And so, you know, this block, the housing here was every bit as interesting as over there. And so people always kind of wanted to figure out how do we do that? And so we, we dabbled in it. We probably didn't go wholeheartedly into it, um, but we, we, there was an article in the Times about it, uh, people being interested in, in doing so. But it was more recently that really gave people the push to, to do this. And it was, um, you know, a, a, a developer was buying some homes on the block and wanted to um, build up. He wanted to kind of demo his half of the building and build a, a six floor unit. And people were, you know, kind of moved to action. Like, how can we stop this? When you realize we're all zoned, it's two family homes on this block, but we are zoned to be our six. So people could, in theory, uh, build up. And so, one of the few ways of, of actually stopping that would, would be either to rezone, which costs millions of dollars, or to look into becoming a historic district. And fortunately enough for the people on this block, you know, they actually had grounds to, to, to get that to be examined and explore that. Um, so we contacted our, our uh, you know, local city council member, which is, who is the uh, Rafael Salamanca, and we were also, it's like all these good fortunes kind of came into play, right? Uh, he was our, he was our, uh, he represented our district, but also he was the, um, the head of housing and land use uh, committee on the, on, in the city council. And so when we kind of talked about what our situation was, you know, he was very familiar with the block, you know, he was able to kind of really, you know, get the, the, all the, the right people at the table to listen to it, to us. And we were able to have meetings with them, show them the block, they were able to see. And the fact that, you know, it is rare, you know, to have both sides of the block uh, appear, you know, especially in this day and age, um, still be residential, still have those things. Um, we were able to kind of keep it, keep it moving and push it through. And so, um, you know, in 2020, we, we, we did get that designation. I do want to say too, it was that that tour we did in, in early 2020, that was like, it felt like one of the last things we were able to do together without masks, right? Because like a couple of weeks later, you know, the pandemic kind of just took yeah. over. So it was like, you didn't know it was coming. Um, so, and, and it makes it all the more sweeter to see those pictures again. Um, and so, so you know, um, yeah, that, was that was before the pandemic, huh? Wow. Yeah, it was like a week before the pandemic. <laughs> really? We, yeah. We, we got it in right there on that line. Oh yeah. my God! I didn't realize. Yeah. I'm sorry, Maria. I didn't mean to. No, no. So, so I mean, um, really, again, it. What we did is we did a lot of legwork, and and we were one of the other great fortunes we have on this block is the fact that it still is mainly owner occupied. The owners of the homes live here. So when people wanted to see something happen, you were able to, you know, create a petition, actually have owners, you know, participating, which may also makes it, um, you know, makes people listen a little bit more. And, and, um, and a lot of, you know, everybody got together, they did the, the, the petitions, they sat in on the meetings with landmarks and, and really you know um put, put it forward and, and so you know that's just some of the blessings of the, the great parts of this block and, and so forth so i mean i i really want to just i yeah. don't know my brain's all over the place but want to hear any any questions or any any other 
thoughts or anything else anybody has. So I, I do know that the, the council member, Rafael Salamanca, he was very much involved in this process and he, he testified in favor of, of the designation. And so I, I want to know what it meant for this, uh, for this campaign to, to have uh, the council members support, considering that he is the chair of the um, land use committee at city council, what, what it meant, how, how helpful was that? Well, that, he was invaluable, you know, I mean, his office, you know, they were always, you know, they still call me, you know, to say, hey, this is what's going to happen, you know, with that, getting things together, where do we want to put the signage when it does come, <laughs> for the, finally to do the ribbon cutting of, of the historic district. Um, and I think uh, also the fact, I mean, we're the 13th landmark, uh, right, a historic district in the Bronx, the Bronx, which yeah. is an unlucky number, but I think the 150th in the city overall is a great, you know, great number. That's a great landmark too, you know. Um, so we're we're really excited about that, and I think um, it was something he was excited about too, because it, it, this is a one way that you know you can fight, kind of, kind of try to stave off gentrification in the sense, you know, he he, you know, having developers come knock down old great old houses to put up you know six six floor you know uh buildings and, and generate all this income for apartments in, in on this block which is you know really interesting it, you know this is one way of of keeping it families working families who have been here for a long time uh raise their kids the kids are living and you know taking over you know some of these houses as well um this is really you know it, it was a win-win for him in a sense yeah, yeah. Again, if, if anyone has any question, please feel free to type them on the chat or, or unmute yourself and ask your question. And uh, I do wanted to ask Maria, there are, there are we are working with a couple of uh, community groups across the city, also in the Bronx, who, who want to have their neighborhood or their streets landmarked. Uh, we, a couple of weeks, Months ago, we started a, a campaign with the Parkchester, and uh, there's a lot of community support in Parkchester. But some of the community members that I've talked to, they 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 see the designation process as something that is, that it's it's very far from from accomplishing. So, what would be your, your advice for someone who's just starting and someone who wants to preserve their their block, their neighborhood, and who you know, someone who's just starting, what would you say to them? Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, you know, part of what we, what I do at the point, you know, in, you know, we, we do arts and we do community revitalization and, and things, but it's also, you know, working with young people and it's really helping them to see the beauty of what's around them in their community to really care about the community, right? And and so here, you know, in Hunts Point, we have a lot of things. We have a lot of things that we could say makes it terrible, but we have a lot of things that we say make it so unique and fabulous that if you kind of focus on those things, you can get rid of all the other things that you think are so terrible. And so I, I feel like every community has has that beauty to it, right? Otherwise nobody would stay there, you know? Um, and, and there's something interesting to it. And I think you focus on those things and you really, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot, you know, you have to know the city council people, your community board, you could start with your community board because that's the first level, right? Um, contact the, your, your district manager there, you know, try to get your, your council member um, and really just getting your neighbors too. I mean, the more people that you can get to, to talk about things and, 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 and make some noise that the, the easier things kind of get with this city, right? The squeaky wheel gets the grease and, and that's important. And, and you, you just kind of get this, you could, if you could build that way, you know? For us here, you know, like I said, you know, we had a great circumstance in terms of, this is a very unique block. This is a very unique community. Um, and so we had a lot of things to, to grab onto. Parkchester has a lot of 
stories and history to it. I mean, it's about working families, you know, giving them spaces and, and, and all of the, you know, at least parts of the part of Parkchester that I know about. I don't know the whole history, but, you know, there's, there's a lot to it that, um, you know, you could grasp onto and kind of use that to, to propel forward for that support. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, I, I also think it's very important to think about the, the emotions that uh, we are preserving. When, when you do landmarking, you are preserving the, the memories, the emotional connections that the initial residents have to those, uh, to those uh, places. And so Dan Karatsas, if you are willing to, <laughs> to talk, I would like to hear from you what it meant to you emotionally to have the, the street that your, your mother lived on, your, all your family lived there. What, it, what did it mean to you? When, when, um, it was, <clears throat> when it okay, was... well, sure. Um, I mean, part of it had to do that with to do that my mother's family took tons of photographs. So after her death, I was the one who ended up with this, you know, the, the photo albums and they took tons of photos. And when I had seen the article in the Times so, you know, about 10 years ago, and it, it mentioned the Hercules family, which whose name was in my grandmother's, you know, phone book, which remained in my storage bin in the basement. Uh, what I had said in my testimony was that for whatever reason, um, the block sort of loomed large in their imagination. My mother's much younger sister is still alive now living in Virginia. And, um, you know, she has a childhood friend who's living in Westchester who they were at 848. And I think the friends were at 852. Um, and, uh, you know, the... We went back to visit in the 70s. So my grandmother lived there for a little over 20 years and left in the early 60s. And when we went back in the 70s, which were the worst years for New York City, and of course we were in a car, you know, driving from Queens, um, it was noticeable that the block had, had stayed relatively intact relative to the apartment buildings one block over, which were now vacant. And so, you know, I re this sort of as somebody who's been active in Jackson Heights for the last 30 years, I was certainly, you know, warmed the heart for there to be people like Maria and the other residents to be out there, you know, fighting the good fight. Because it's, and unfortunately, it's usually driven by, you know, development plans or negative things that sort of will finally get people out of their recliners or lethargy to actually do something. But I sort of say, you know, to, to a large degree, the, um, you know, maybe architecture is destiny to some degree and on pleasant blocks where people had a pride of place, regardless of, you know, uh, their ethnic group, their age, whatever it might be, um, that's, that's what maintains community. And, you know, thanks to the Historic Districts Council to being out, to being there for people over the years, including me living in Jackson Heights. Um, but uh, it's good to know that, um, well, that these things matter and that there are people out there that care enough to sort of see it through because it's not an easy process. And then my final comment would be that the, I would think that the Landmarks Commission and the other city agencies are probably a little bit more attuned to um, inclusiveness with regards to landmarking properties than they may have been in the past when it was typically focused on fancier buildings that had been usually housing the middle, the upper middle class or higher. And as years have gone by, um, you know, they're now taking a, cl a closer and more careful look at those that housed, housed sort of average middle class people. So my hat's off to you, Maria. And so uh, hopefully you can use those photos because there's more of them if you want them. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I left them in my office and I, I didn't get to, and, and the flash drive that I put them on to, get, to send to uh, Diego, and I'm sorry about that, because there are, they are some interesting ones as well. And, and that was also part of what, you know, probably helped us here. We had about three or four, maybe five families that have lived on this block since the, the late 50s to, to 
present. And then, you know, I mean, I've lived here since 1995 and I'm the, the, the young kid on the block, right? You have Miss Ross who's lived on the block since the 50s. So I guess she, she may have known your family. Mrs. Ross at, at a eight sixty, I forget, she's right at the last one right next to the point. Um, and then, you know, Mr. Phillips and the Hercules family and the Johnsons who've lived here, you know, they're all still here. I mean, Miss Ross just celebrated her 99th birthday and she's she's still going strong and we, we hope to have her here to do a nice you know 100th next year um but it, it was voices like her you know signing so happy to sign off and and hear about you know what was possibly going to happen with the block and so you know i one of the things is i was hoping to get a sign to sign to be in front of her house we have to have it a, a little bit further up the block but um you know that i think that's something that we you know definitely want to make sure that her and Mrs. Johnson, um, you know, and, and Mr. Phillips and the Hercules, you know, get to, you know, take a nice picture around that once it finally does come into play. Um, but it was having folks like that here, um, you know, to, to tell their stories that I think that also is really powerful. You don't see that a lot in the city and let alone in the Bronx, let alone New York City very often. Yeah. And that's why I think, I think I put it in the chat that it would be amazing, uh, Maria, if at all possible, if there was some some bit of um, funding or something to just do like a good five minute, 10 minute documentary on the entire process, especially to memorize, uh, memorialize some of the folks you just mentioned that are that are living on the block in the journey, because I think that could possibly be one of our things in our toolbox that we could say, listen, this is the journey of the Menina Historic District. And what it took and i think that may be something that may be worth considering uh and we could use it for marketing purposes so that we could get more communities uh involved in the designation process but that's a live testimony which is amazing yeah thank you thank you everyone so before we finish our meeting i would like to ask uh, maria or angel or sam if there are any other potential landmarks individual landmarks potential districts in Hunts Point that we should be paying attention to? Any historic building that you think that's worth preserving uh, that we should be paying attention to? Would you think? Uh, to well, two, two off, you know, off the top of my head, like we mentioned, the Corpus Christi Monastery, I think, should definitely be something um, that we look into. And then I, I was also wondering about the firehouse, which is on um, Seneca and the uh, Vale, I think. I don't know how old that is, but um, that also has an interesting architecture to it. And I'm sure they've been there. And probably all the things that they weathered during the 70s, the burning of the Bronx and, and the area in general, um, might be something, uh, a nice way to, to, to salute those, those firefighters that were there during that time. 1911, I believe. To 1911, I know it was 19 teens early. Yeah, that's a beautiful building. It's a Italian Renaissance. It has the uh, the balconies on top, and they said that they can see the fires where it's happening in the balcony. <laughs> I mean, fires are not okay. fun, but you know. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Angel. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Dan, for for what you shared with us, and thank you, everyone who joined this meeting. It's wonderful to see people interested in um, preserving the history of the Bronx. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we are highlighting different areas of this borough. So please, um, we are gonna be sending information about future events and please check our website uh, to know about uh, our upcoming events, any our walking tours, virtual tours. We have a lot of activity that we want you to be part of. So thank you everyone for joining and I hope to see you soon in, a, in, a, in our next conversation or walking tour or event. Thank you, Diego. Take care. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thanks, Diego. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.